Good morning. My name is Joe Cressy. I'm a senior vice president here at George Brown College. And on behalf of our team, our administrators, our staff, and, and most of all our students, welcome to our college and our waterfront campus. Minister Guibault, Minister Tassi, Minister Anand, Parliamentary Secretary de Bruzen, it's an honor to have you here. In fact, I think we're joined by nearly a dozen members of the government caucus. And I can say from my time in government, when you have an announcement and your entire government front bench shows up, you know it's a big deal. And this is a very big deal. Let me begin with a land acknowledgement. George Brown College is located on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and other indigenous peoples who have lived here over time. We are grateful to share this land as treaty people who learn, live, work in the community with one another. Uh, today is indeed a very big announcement. And, and let me tell you very briefly why we, a, a public college located in the heart of Toronto, are proud to host it. Um, as a college, we're fundamentally in the business of seeking to build a better future. We're in the business of training future leaders and conducting research to solve problems. We're in the business of addressing labor shortage and building stronger communities. And as a college, we're interested in solutions. And that's on the subject of today. It's why we created North America's first of its kind EV technician training program. It's a one year certificate program offered by our School of Continu Continuous Learning. And it's been a huge success in just one year We've partnered with 19 colleges and universities across Canada and the United States to administer it. More than 600 students are in. And after today's announcement, we're confident more will join. And it's just one of many clean tech programs that we have coming soon, including a wind uh, turbine uh, technician program. So let me close, because you're not here to hear from me. Um, building a more sustainable and prosperous country is the task of each and every one of us in industry and post-secondary, in workplaces and communities, we all have a role to play. But it starts with government, and that's where we're seeing leadership today. And on that note, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Julie de Bruzen, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, and a proud MP representing the waterfront here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe, and thank you for welcoming us to this beautiful campus. It's really such a jewel right here on the waterfront. Um, I am pleased to join you today I, as your MC. I am the Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Environment and Climate Change and to the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources. And today we're going to be talking about a really exciting development for the future. So we're going to talk about we just met with some of the people who are running some amazing programs that Joe was just describing um, with EV technologies and how we're really at the forefront of some of the education pieces right here. And today you're going to hear um, from some members of our government, starting with Minister Guilbeau, about an exciting announcement in the work that we're doing. So. I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Minister Gilbo up here to talk about the work that he's been doing. He is fresh back from COP28, uh, where he was really a central figure in trying to push things forward as we're talking about where the world needs to move on environment and climate change. Um, just last year, when we were making the first announcement of uh, the parts we were doing on this uh, sales availability, availability target, he was at COP15 negotiating some amazing work that we're doing as a country leader uh, in a leadership role on biodiversity. So today, I'm going to be welcoming Minister Gibo to talk to us a little bit about the next steps that we're doing when it comes to these amazing electric vehicles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie, and thank you, Joe, for that uh, warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I want to thank many of my parliamentary colleagues who are here today, including Ministers Tassi and Anan, as well as MPs Francesco Sorbara, Majid Jawari, Rob Oliphant, and Julie. Oh, Julie's not arrived yet, but Julie Jesuit will be with us shortly, I'm told. And as Joe has shown, the atmosphere here at George Brown is electric. What an ideal place to be talking about the transformation on the way in Canada. Just a few minutes ago, 
we met with some faculty and students from the electric vehicle technician program, one of the largest continuing EV technician training programs in Canada. They know electric cars are the future. They're skating to where the puck is going, preparing for careers with good paying jobs. But they're also doing it from a place of concern about the world they're leaving to the next generation, a world with more frequent and extreme weather, with high cost of living and unsustainable levels of pollution. But the choice they're making with their careers gives us hope. Young people like those studying at George Brown are driving towards the solution we need to build a more sustainable and prosperous future. The Government of Canada is right here with you. Over the past number of years, we've doubled down on support for clean technologies, helping people with energy saving home renovations and heat pumps, building a clean electricity grid, putting a cap on the pollution from the oil and gas sector. All of these things means the creation of good paying jobs while tackling the climate crisis we face. And that's where the puck, that's put us on track to meet our climate goals. As part of that strategy, we have a comprehensive plan to build a robust electric vehicle supply chain and supporting infrastructure. Today, we're announcing the next step in this plan, the electric vehicle availability standard that drives Canada towards all new light duty vehicle sales in Canada to be electric or plug-in hybrid by 2035. This includes the interim goals along the way, beginning with 20% of all new vehicle sales be EVs by 2026. The standard tackles one of the main barriers to people buying EVs, the limited availability and long wait time. We will do this by ensuring more electric cars come to the Canadian market instead of the US or other markets that have similar targets. It ensures Canadians have access to our fair share of the global supply of these vehicles. Since we started consulting on this, the new electric vehicle availability standard now includes an early credit system to help automakers comply by encouraging them to get more EVs on the market as early as possible and, and even next year and to build more charging infrastructure. This will also help Canadians with the cost of living. EVs are quickly reaching cost parity with their gas powered alternatives as new model of electric sedans, trucks, SUVs, crossover, and more keep coming on the market. Almost all industry projections show that by the end of the decades, the decade at the latest, the purchase price of gas powered and electric cars will be about the same. The Government of Canada offers purchase incentives to help close the gap on new EVs. Many provinces and territories offer these purchase incentives as well. And once you drive the car off the lot, the saving on fueling and maintenance costs are enormous. For example, let's take the comparison of standard gas powered hatchback compared to EVs alternative with current market price, like the ones we have here. Over a 10 year span, the gas powered car costs you over $82,000 during its lifetime, but an electric car would only cost about $50,000. That's over $30,000 in savings for Canadians. That's because the electricity you buy to power your electric vehicle is much cheaper than gasoline and not subject to the volatility of international oil prices. And the maintenance cost of EVs are a fraction of internal combustion cars. The benefits from electric vehicles go beyond savings, saving the climate and consumer cost. They also mean sustainable, sustainably cleaner and healthier hair. We've known for a long time that air pollution from gas powered vehicles has detrimental health effects and increases the risk of serious illness in children and older people. Imagine a world in which there was no pollution from car smog or what a difference that would make to our quality of life. It is a very exciting prospect, especially for any Canadian living near major roads or in busy cities. Aujourd'hui, notre gouvernement annonce la prochaine étape de notre plan visant à construire une chaîne d'approvisionnement et une infrastructure de soutien solide pour la construction de véhicules électriques. Nous introduisons la norme sur la disponibilité des véhicules électriques pour amener le Canada vers notre objectif que 100% des ventes de véhicules légers neufs soient électriques ou hybrides rechargeables d'ici 2035. Cela suit de près les normes déjà en place au Québec et en Colombie-Britannique, ce qui a permis à ces provinces de dépasser leur objectif que 20% des ventes de véhicules neufs soient électriques. Et cela donnera un énorme coup de pouce à la chaîne d'approvisionnement de véhicules électriques qui est en pleine émergence 
et qui amène déjà des investissements de plus d'un milliard de dollars dans les batteries et le traitement des minéraux essentiels. Alors que le transport représente près du quart de toutes les émissions au Canada, ces nouveaux objectifs de vente réglementés constituent un projet important pour notre plan climatique. Ça va nous permettre d'atteindre nos objectifs pour 2030. Just like these people studying here at George Brown, we're skating to where the puck is going. Last quarter, one in eight of all new vehicles sold across Canada was electric. That's up from one in three at the end of 2020. There's no mistaking it. We are at a tipping point. And the automakers are themselves all going electric too. Across the board, they are switching over to selling only EVs in the coming decades. I know we have a couple of automakers here who were able to join us today and who are themselves leading the charge towards EV. The Government of Canada is helping to ensure we don't get left behind and that we keep driving towards the opportunities being created. And I think this is the difference between our approach and that of this new MAGA-style Conservative Party under Pierre Polièvre. He proudly spreads misinformation about EVs being less environmentally friendly than gas-powered cars. And he consistently rejects to support game-changing investment in new EV plants, creating thousands of jobs here in Ontario and across the country. His approach continues to be bury his hand in the sand, ignore the change happening around him, and leave Canadians to miss out on the economic opportunities, energy savings, as well as health and environmental benefits. We would like to see all federal parties support these policies to help tackle climate change while growing a strong Canadian economy. Our government will not apologize for being confident in the role Canada can play in the cleaner economy of the 21st century. We are determined to, live, to leave this world better than we found it. For these students here at George Brown and for all of our children and young Canadians. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister Guilbeault. Um, our next speaker is the Honourable Anita Anand, President of Canada's Treasury Board, Member of Parliament for Oakville, Ontario. Um, when I say Oakville, I think many of you will recognize that as a location of a very large Ford plant. So she comes with a lot of experience when we're talking about electric vehicles and auto manufacturing. So please join me in welcoming Minister Anand. Well, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Julie. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, C'est un grand, grand plaisir d'être ici à Toronto avec vous tous. And thank you so much, uh, Joe, and everyone here at George Brown for welcoming us uh, to this fine campus. It's my first time here at George Brown, so it's great to be here with you. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank Minister Gilbo for welcoming us to the announcement today. And it's great to see Kara and Sarah and Julie and Majid and Rob and Francesco here as well. Um, just we rose at the House of Commons last week and I've been missing um, my MP colleagues. So it's great to see you guys here today. Uh, Philomena, great to see you. Didn't stop by Oakville on the way down from Hamilton to pick me up. So I guess you were in a rush on the QEW as we always are. Um, listen, I really took heart from some of the words that Stephen mentioned. This idea of skating to where the puck is going, it's absolutely crucial, not just in government as a whole, but certainly in environmental policy making and implementing the policies that are necessary for time periods that we are looking at 2030, 2040, 2050, etc. Kara um, Clareman, for example, she and I worked uh, together 20 years ago, 25 years ago at the same law firm, and she actually did that. She was skating to where the puck is going now with your work at, at Plug and Drive. So thank you, Kara, and all stakeholders for being with us today. Et nous savons que les changements climatiques sont cruciales et importants. Nous devons avoir une réponse. We have to have a response to climate change. It is trite at this point to say that climate change is the greatest threat to our health, our economy, our humanity. Really what we need to do is skate to where the puck is going, is to identify what policy prescriptions we need to put in place to address the threat 
to our planet that currently exists. Et la norme sur la disponibilité des véhicules électriques sera un outil important pour s'assurer que les fabricants et les importateurs prennent des mesures pour réduire les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. This electric availability standard that Stephen just announced is going to be a game changer. It's a significant tool to ensure that manufacturers and importers take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think in all of our jobs, we're talking about supply chain. Regardless of where you are, what you're doing, you're talking about supply chain, the effect of COVID on the supply chain, the work we're doing in this current economic environment to address the supply chain. Well, the announcement today about the electric vehicle availability standard is going to have a significant effect on the supply chain, but also making sure that we address climate change realities and skate to where the puck is going. So one of the things I really love that Stephen mentioned is this idea about taking necessary steps. We are actually putting in place the electric vehicle availability standard on top of a comprehensive set of measures to address greenhouse gas emissions. And one of those measures, of course, and I have to mention it, is the $295 million federal investment in the Ford Motor Plant's repurposed battery electric vehicle facility in Oakville, Ontario. And you're right, Julie, that that is something that I have watched and learned from and work with as the Member of Parliament in Oakville. And I can see the massive transformation that is occurring in our vehicle production facilities. And I know that our caucus here today, Francesco included, has taken a leading role in terms of what we're doing in the auto automotive industry. So thank you for that work. Now, you might be asking, like, why is Anita up here? What does she have to do with this file at Treasury Board? Well, the Government of Canada has the largest fixed asset portfolio in Canada, and that includes 40,000 vehicles. So this is an important announcement today in terms of what we're going to be doing in our government fleet in addressing climate change realities. Just as we are asking manufacturers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, our government is no different. And with more than these 40,000 vehicles in our fleet, we need to lead by example. We need to make sure that we are greening and continue to green our government fleet. And I will tell you that the work is not just beginning today. We have a strategy in place called the Greening Government Strategy. We have seen a 40% reduction in emissions from on-road vehicles since 2005. And we are making progress in transitioning to 100% zero emission vehicles by 2030. And this is our target under our Greening Government Strategy. And every time I see Stephen Gilbo or Julie DeBruzen stand up in the House of Commons talking about our strategy as a government to reduce emissions, I think to myself, and that has relevance to the greening government fleet as well. So what I have seen at Treasury Board is what we adopt as a government has an impact on what businesses across the country do. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing that progress as businesses across the country, including our auto manufacturers, transition to a green fleet. Donc, partout au Canada et dans l'ensemble des opérations gouvernementales, nous continuerons de prendre les mesures nécessaires pour atteindre la carbone neutralité d'ici 2050. And across government, that's what we're going to be trying to hit taking the necessary steps to make sure that we are skating towards the puck and where the puck is going. So merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Well, merci beaucoup, Ministre Anand, and thank you for that information and your leadership. And I am now pleased to introduce the Honourable Philomena Tassi, Minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, 
Member of Parliament for Hamilton West in Ancaster Dundas. For people who like spending time on the waterfront, if you go check out Love Park, that is one of the parks that has received support through um, Minister Tassi's agency. So thanks, thanks for being Julie. here. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to see so many people here. Uh, great to be joined by my amazing colleagues. And um, the George Brown welcome that we got here was fantastic. So Joe, to you and your team, thank you so much. And also very pleased to, to be joined by some students. So look, folks, Canadians have been very clear about what they want. They want clean air, good jobs, a healthy environment, and a strong economy which is why our government is taking bold and immediate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while strengthening our economy. And yes, both can be done at the same time. We have set ambitious targets to reduce our emissions by at least 40% by 2030. And a large part of this mission is to put more electric vehicles on the road. To help achieve these ambitions, the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario has been working to bolster our EV supply chain and empower automotive workers. Since 2015, FedDev Ontario has invested nearly $57.5 million into 16 EV projects, estimated to have created and maintained more than 900 jobs, including over $5 million for Project Arrow. Flavio Volpe and the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association's Made in Canada original zero emissions concept vehicle. It actually is being taken around the world. We are also meeting regularly with EV industry leaders across our region to help the supply chain grow and prosper. And Invest Windsor Essex has created an incredible job site where people looking to get into these EV jobs have a one-stop shop to find out what the skills that they need and then it connects them to opportunities to obtain those skills and then connects them to employers that are looking for workers to occupy these positions. There is an evolution happening today in Canada's auto sector. EVs are truly the road ahead for the automotive industry and the economy. And auto manufacturers right here in Ontario and across the country are harnessing their expertise to support the growing electric vehicle market. The auto sector currently employs over 500,000 workers in 2022 and contributed $14 billion to our GDP. The growth in EV production is creating exciting new opportunities for the automotive supply chain manufacturers, and most importantly, our talented workers. And we are seizing that opportunity. The future is very bright. The EV battery supply chain alone has the potential to create 250,000 jobs by 2030 and add $48 billion to the economy. Our government is focused on ensuring that that dream becomes a reality. I am pleased to say that 95% of Canadian automotive parts and supplier facilities are located in Southern Ontario. Thanks to the work of industry leaders and the tens of thousands of workers, we are well positioned to create an end-to-end -end made in Canada supply chain for the EV sector, as Minister Anand has mentioned. We are committing to net zero emissions and supporting local manufacturers as they adopt more sustainable processes and technologies to create good jobs for Canadians. These are jobs for the future, and they are going to last for generations. They're not just jobs for my children. They're jobs for my great-great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren. Today's announcement will go a long way to fight climate change and create a net zero economy by supporting growth in world-leading technologies that make industry cleaner. The Government of Canada has made unprecedented investments over the past several years to build out zero emissions vehicle production. This is a significant opportunity, and I know that Southern Ontario will be ready to seize the day. The key here, I think, folks, is collaboration. Here we are at George Brown College learning about the technological courses that they are offering online, making it easier. We, of course, are working with industry, with um, uh, our economic development partners, and together 
we can really seize this opportunity and create those amazing jobs and put Canada as a leader in the world in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Tassi. Um, and I am now going to be passing over the mic to Kara Clareman, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Plug and Drive. Plug and Drive is a nonprofit organization that's played a major role in helping Canadians make the switch. In fact, when we uh, released the draft regulations last year, uh, we did it at the plug and drive facility. And uh, to show that uh, Kara is clearly fearless, uh, she took me up for a test drive in one of her vehicles. We all live to say that it was a great day together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Julie, and it was such a pleasure to have you make the effort to come to our center and take a test drive, and I really encourage any of you who've not, not yet had that opportunity to take that uh, opportunity, because uh, not only are you going to be doing something good for the environment, you're also going to have super lots of fun. They're great to drive. Uh, so as Julie mentioned, I'm Kara Clareman, President and CEO of Plug and Drive. It's my pleasure to be here at George Brown College, and thank you to Mr. Cressy for hosting us here. Uh, it's my honor to support Ministers Gilbo, Anand, and Tassi as they announce their next steps in making EVs more available on the Canadian market. So for those of you who are not familiar with Plug and Drive, we're a nonprofit. We're accelerating EV adoption, primarily through education. At Plug and Drive, we've been getting those butts in the seats for uh, over 13 years now, and we're proud to say we've encouraged thousands of Canadians to switch from gas to electric. Through our EV Discovery Centre now at Young and Bloor uh, in Toronto, uh, as well as our what we call our mobile EV education trailer, or the MEET, uh, as well as our EV Roadshow, we are traveling across Canada, offering education and test drives to all Canadians, kicking gas one driver at a time. So I don't need to explain to this crowd why Canada is the perfect place to encourage EV driving. With our low emitting and low cost electricity, EVs reduce greenhouse gas emissions in every province of Canada, as Canada's grid overall is about 80% non-GHG emitting and getting lower all the time. And by the way, we often hear concerns raised about the grid being able to handle the load. And I'm confident it can and it will, and we can talk more about that later. EVs not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but they also save money. Electricity is about one quarter to one sixth the price of gas, depending on the province. And maintenance is much cheaper too, as you heard from Minister Gubo. So consumers save money. I know that I have, but don't take my word for it. You can visit the Plug and Drive website. We have a great calculator on there where you can compare your current gas car to any EV on the market and see how much you're going to save month to month. Uh, as you heard this morning, and Clean Energy Canada has done some great work in this area, you can see that over a 10-year period, you're going to save in the ballpark of $30,000. Huge savings for Canadians. Now let's talk about vehicle supply. The automakers are bringing out such amazing products with new announcements to be heard almost every week. Canada is positioned to be a big part of this transition with numerous facilities to manufacture EVs and batteries in Canada starting as early as this year. This is amazing news for Canada. And with such a variety of cars to choose from with more range, amazing pickup, and low total cost of ownership, we all know we're on the cusp of unprecedented growth in EV sales, which means, of course, big greenhouse gas reductions too. However, as someone who spends their time talking to consumers about EVs, one of the biggest barriers we hear to adoption right now is lack of availability. Long wait lists are definitely discouraging consumers to make the switch, even when they're ready. If we all agree we're in a climate emergency, we need to help consumers switch as soon as possible, not two years from now. We need to take action to increase the EV supply in Canada. Some people say this regulatory regime is telling consumers what car they can buy. That, that's just not true. This legislation is gonna help increase supply so consumers can choose an EV if they want one. Some are also saying that this might hurt our competitiveness in a global auto market. Well, 17 US states and a number of other countries already have similar legislation. So I would argue we need this to make sure Canada doesn't miss out on its fair share of the world's EV supply. 
It's also going to help level the playing field across Canada in terms of EV availability, which really varies significantly depending on which province you live in. So, in summary, we all know that the right EV policies can help our country achieve its climate goals and can help drive, pun intended, uh, our clean energy future. That's why Plug and Drive is happy to be working with the government, industry, and all the NGOs that are here today to support the government in their EV-friendly policy initiatives like this announcement being made today. We need to focus on the essential elements of education, infrastructure, as well as EV supply. We're pleased to support the government in their efforts to increase supply of EVs, and we look forward to further collaboration to make sure EVs are available, affordable, and chargeable in every part of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cara. And um, next, we've talked a little bit about the clean air that comes from when we use zero emission vehicles. So today, I'm happy to be welcoming an expert in that area. Sarah Butson is the Director of Public Affairs with the Canadian Lung Association. So please join me in welcoming Sarah. Thank you, Julie. And it's an honor to be introduced by my own MP, uh, Julie de Bruzen, so thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Sarah Butson, and I'm here today on behalf of the Canadian Lung Association. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Canadian Lung Association, we are one of Canada's oldest health charities. Uh, and in fact, for over 120 years, our focus has been breathing. Uh, so we are really excited to be a part of today's announcement uh, to you know, talk about bold measures to protect that breath. The air we breathe is essential to life, yet the quality of that air is increasingly compromised. As we navigate our daily lives, we are often unwittingly exposing ourselves to harmful pollutants, often released by the countless vehicles that surround us. These pollutants infiltrate our air and subsequently our respiratory system. The consequences are alarming. Traffic-related air pollution aggravates symptoms for those with lung disease. It leads to respiratory illness like asthma. It can worsen chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and can lead to a range of other illnesses, including lung cancer. In fact, air pollution broadly in Canada is responsible for at least 15,000 lost lives every year. The impacts of our, on our lungs are not shared equally. The health burden, as with other issues, is felt greatest by our most vulnerable populations. And this includes children, the elderly, those living closest to roadways and high traffic areas, and of course, those with pre-existing respiratory conditions. In fact, traffic-related air pollution alone is responsible for over 200,000 asthma symptom days and 2.7 million acute respiratory symptom days. Those with lung disease have long been aware of the importance of clean air, but really, if you have lungs, <laughs> this announcement is important to you today. The Canadian Lung Association recently did some national polling data, and it tells us that, in fact, this is an issue for everyone. In fact, more than one third of respondents said that poor air quality and worsening air pollution are already having an impact on their health. And almost 80% were concerned specifically with how traffic emissions were affecting their air quality. Finally, 86% of Canadians polled felt that solutions like the ones announced today that address the health effects of air quality should be a priority. The air we breathe is meant to invigorate and sustain us. But if we don't take measures to protect it, it can become a source of peril for our lungs and our overall health. Not just for those of us in the room today, but for future generations. So it is critical that health is a central part of what drives our environmental protection goals. Uh, because as we say at the Canadian Lung Association, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Thank you.
Well, so true. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciated that too. Um, so now I'd just like to take a moment to highlight a few things. People might have some questions, but um, it's kind of been exciting walking around here, right? Like right across from us, there's a building, the Lemberloss building. It's a mass timber building, federal support to have it built. And as I understand it, it's the largest industrial, no, did I get not industrial, institutional um, net zero building and mass timber building in Ontario. It's happening right here. It's exciting things that we're getting to see. We're also seeing a lot happening with federal investments in public transit. And there's a lot of work that's happening right across our, our country as we move to a cleaner electrical grid. I know that uh, Kara talked about that. I want to also kind of highlight some other fun things that are happening here. When you look out that window, you're going to see some amazing work that's happening in the portlands with um, a federal, provincial, and municipal project that's moving the mouth of the Don River. That's flood protecting over a thousand homes uh, in the city. And it's also helping to create better wetlands for a cleaner Lake Ontario. These are kinds of things that are really exciting to see as we're moving towards projects that are helping sustainability. Now, I did want to mention something because I know a lot of people have questions about charging infrastructure. So if I can just briefly like talk a bit about that. Most drivers will do most of their charging at home. It's actually the number is about 80% will be doing their charging at home as their primary place. Which is a bit of a shift in the way we think when we think of having to gas up somewhere with our car. Most of the time it's going to be having at home. But there's also going to be a need for charging infrastructure right across our country that's publicly available. Uh, federally, the Canada Infrastructure Bank has recently announced financing for fast chargers across Canada, including 2,000 from Parkland and another 2,000 from Flow. And there's going to be more to go on that. Uh, and through the ZEVIT program, which is a zero emission vehicle infrastructure program, the Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development confirmed that we're actually on track to meet our target of 33,500 chargers by 2026. And we've committed funding for over 43,000 chargers to date. And we're also glad because government's not going to be able to do this alone. We're pleased to see major automakers are advancing a joint venture for charging. And we're also seeing major retailers get into the charging space as well. Today's announcement, um, and Mr. Minister Guilbeault kind of mentioned that in his remarks, will be incentivizing companies to do even more by providing credits for charging investments made by automakers and adding predictability for investors in charging services. So this is an example of how all those pieces can come together. We're working on a cleaner electrical grid. We're working on sustainability from our built environment. And today, major, major change that we're talking about as far as um, changes that we're making in our transportation day to day. I'm very glad that you can be here. This is the conclusion of our formal remarks, but I would like to invite my caucus colleagues, all of them up here, because we will now be moving to a media availability. Thank you. Uh, this concludes the uh, announcement portion. We'll be moving to media questions and answers. We kindly ask that you state your name and media outlet and that you keep it to one question and one follow up. Hi, Tini as Danny with City News. So there are still lots of concerns about affordability, about the incomes, uh, the impacts on low income communities. What if electric vehicles don't reach price parity with gas vehicles by 2035? What's the plan then? Well, as we as we said in, in, in this press conference, um, if you look over, so it's about the purchase of the cost, but it's also about the operating cost of, of owning a vehicle. And over a 10-year lifespan, Clean Energy Canada estimated that the savings for an average vehicle like the ones we have here, compared a, a gas-powered vehicle versus an electric vehicle, the savings are $30,000. And we know that as more electric vehicles come on the roads, the price are coming down. That's what that's the trend we, we, we've seen, not just here, but all around the world. Uh, in countries like Norway, uh, EVs already represent more than 80% of, of, of new sales, 40% in, in China. So this is where the world auto sector is going. 
Okay, and there is still a lot of skepticism about having this infrastructure in place, uh, even by, by 2026, when that first goal is to be reached. Um, it, Shouldn't the government be working on having that infrastructure in place before uh, creating these targets? Well, two provinces are already above that 20% threshold, Quebec, Quebec and, and BC. And why are they above that threshold? Because they've put in place similar systems as the one we're announcing here today. Those two provinces have deployed charging stations before other provinces. They have their own incentives. I worked on the Quebec system when I was at Equitaire, and it works. Um, so we are deploying we are deploying infrastructure infrastructure charging stations. Uh, already twenty five thousand have been have been installed. We'll get to about eighty five thousand by by twenty twenty nine. So so it is happening. And as Julie was saying, eighty percent of people will charge their vehicle at home. So there is still a need for 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 an infrastructure systems for. Um, for, for cross country, uh, for, for longer distances, but by and large, most EV owners will charge themselves at, at, at home. Ritika Dubé with the Canadian Press. So talking about charging cars at home, um, are you going to expand the rebate uh, program for people who want to establish their um, at home charging infrastructure? And it also expands to people who are living in condos. So they're also seeing this accessibility issue when it comes to charging cars. So what is the plan for that? So right now, the federal government has an incentive program for the purchase of vehicles. Some provinces will offer support for the installation of, of, of uh, home charging stations. Um, in terms of uh, multi-unit buildings, uh, that is one of the things we're working on. Um, Minister Wilkinson at Natural Resources Canada is working on a revision of the of the building code, and this is certainly something we will be integrating in in, in the revised building codes to ensure that uh, new build new buildings that will be built moving forward after 2025 will have the electrical capacity to accommodate uh, charging stations. Sorry, a follow up. What about the existing oh, infrastructure? Yes, yes. Right. Julie. Um, just also that the Zevit program does actually also help support right now uh, adding um, charging infrastructure in um, in buildings, multi-use, or um, sorry, residential buildings. So it's, I, I know I see we have Pollution Probe here um, and the Atmospheric Fund. They are also locally helping to deploy that type of infrastructure right here in our city through the Zevit program. Raheem Ladani, CTV News. Uh, Minister, you talked a lot about skating towards where the puck is going, and I think a lot of provinces can say, yeah, they're doing that with rebates to stack on to what the federal government rebate mm -hmm. is, but not all provinces, including Ontario, are doing that. They haven't shown an appetite for that. Do you have a message for provinces that don't seem to be skating to where the puck is going? Get on board. That would be my message. I mean, especially in Ontario, where with the Ontario government, the federal government is making multi-billion dollar investment in the EV supply chain. There's no reason the, the government of Ontario shouldn't do like BC is doing, like Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Quebec. Uh, there, and there used to be an incentive program in, in, in Ontario. We would welcome Ontario bringing one back. Hey, good morning, Colin DeMello with Global News. Uh, to you, Minister Guibault. So your, your government would have to be re-elected in order for this program to survive. Um, this morning, the Conservative leader, Pierre Polyev, already suggested that he would not continue on with these regulations should the Conservatives form government. So why should manufacturers buy into this program if there really is no guarantee that the program will survive past the next election? As you know, in life, the only two guarantees are taxes and death. Um, and that's especially true in a, in a democracy. A, a newly elected government could choose to, to do things differently. When it comes to Pierre Polyev's conservative government, um, they're anti anything having to do with clean air, clean water, and climate change. They would put an end to all of the support we have for, for Canadians purchasing electric vehicles. 300,000 Canadians have already benefited from that federal support. They would put an end to home energy retrofit programs. They would put an end to money we're in, in investing to clean to clean up the grid. So more climate change is what Pierre Poliev has to offer. Bad, bad air conditions, more bad air conditions, more asthma uh, days, uh, more, more pollution across, across the country. 
That being said, that, that regulation, today we're announcing the final regulation. So, so that regulation will be entering in, in, into force and companies will have to start complying in, in, in 2026. So this regulation is, is the new deal in, in Canada. Right, but you, yeah, yeah. I just Go wanna ahead. add this. I think beyond that, it's the opportunity that presents itself to Canada. We are demonstrating that we are leaders in this space. In terms of the economic development and the job creation and creating those jobs for the future, we are doing this right here. And as my colleague Rob Oliphant says, we have the strongest assets above the ground and below the ground, below the ground with the critical minerals and above the ground with the people. We as a government strongly believe in the ability of Canadians to take this and to really seize the day and the potential. This is going to create the jobs of the future on top of ensuring that we are reducing our GHG emissions. So it's a win-win and to see and to not see that and not recognize that, um, it, it's just regrettable. And I guess I'll just add that we were elected in 2015 largely because of the Prime Minister's commitment to environmental sustainability. And every time I go to the doors, and I know it's the same with my colleagues, we hear from Canadians that they believe that climate change is real and they want their government, governments, I should say, to take action as a result. And so we see that reality every day in this country. Hurricane Fiona, floods, forest fires. And the, those realities require us all to take a step back and say, how are we going to address climate change realities in the short and the long term? And so the announcement today is part of a comprehensive set of environmental policy choices that we are making in response to what we are hearing from Canadians because of the realities of climate change. So it's incredibly short-sighted to say that this would not be something that is in the interests of Canadians, given the need for cleaner air for our children and grandchildren, as we heard from the Lung Association. Thank you. Thank you. And just on charging station deficits, there are long stretches of highways that don't currently have charging stations in between, leading to a lot of range anxiety. Um, apartment buildings, as an example, might not necessarily come equipped with charging stations. Are there incentives as part of any Canadian program to ensure that apartment buildings, as an example, would have charging stations, or there are additional charging stations along long rural stretches of highway? So one of the features of the final regulations compared to the draft regulations that were published a year earlier is that now we're now providing incentives for, for auto companies to invest in charging stations as, as a requirement to, to meet their regulatory obligations. So that's, that's a possibility. So that it's not just a federal government and not just provincial government and companies. We've, we've spoken about the Infrastructure Bank of Canada, which is also investing in deploying uh, charging stations across the country. But now automakers who want, who want to make those investments as part of their regulatory compliant, com, uh, compliant to the regulations will be able to do so. Thank you, merci. This concludes the in-person media. We will now proceed to the online media. I will now hand it over to Samuel Lafontaine to moderate the online portion. Thank you very much. I already see a few hands uh, raised in the chat. Uh, Peut-être qu'on peut commencer par une question en français. Uh, Valérie, est-ce que tu pourrais uh, t'identifier et identifier les médias pour lesquels tu travailles, s'il te plaît? Oui, bonjour, c'est Valérie Gamache de Radio-Canada. Vous m'entendez bien, Monsieur le ministre? Valérie. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Bonjour. On peut, Valérie, on vous entend. 
OK. Euh, Monsieur Guilbault, j'aimerais vous entendre sur... Euh, il y a eu beaucoup d'inquiétudes à savoir euh, c'est bien de mettre autant de véhicules sur les routes. Euh, mettant, euh, par rapport à la capacité de production euh, d'électricité, est-ce euh, que tout ça euh, progresse en même temps ou on va pas se retrouver à un moment donné où on sera plus capable de, de répondre aux besoins? Non, en fait, lorsqu'on regarde les projections, que ce soit à l'horizon 2030, 2035, même jusqu'en 2050, évidemment, le fait d'électrifier le parc de, de véhicules automobiles va, euh, va être lié à une augmentation de la croissance de la demande en électricité. Mais cette, cette demande-là, elle est marginale. Un véhicule, comprendre qu'un véhicule électrique est beaucoup plus efficace en termes de déplacement par unité d'énergie sur un kilomètre, par exemple, qu'une voiture à essence. Une voiture à essence, il y a à peu près 25, si vous mettez un dollar d'essence dans votre voiture, il y a à peu près 25 cents qui sert à vous déplacer. L'autre 75 cents est perdu en, en chaleur, alors qu'un véhicule électrique, selon les modèles, va avoir un taux d'efficacité pour, pour une même unité d'énergie de 84 à 95 Donc, il y a un gain en efficacité énergétique par véhicule qui, qui, qui est très, très, très important. Mais on parle de quelques pourcentages d'augmentation de la consommation d'électricité. Et nous travaillons le, dans le dernier budget fédéral, c'est 40 milliards de dollars que le gouvernement fédéral met à la disposition des provinces et des territoires pour augmenter l'offre d'électricité propre partout au pays au cours des prochaines décennies. Et puis, autre question, euh, j'aimerais que vous entendre, on, bon, on a parlé en anglais là, de, de M. Poilievre qui ne veut pas poursuivre ce, 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 ce régime réglementaire-là. Il y a aussi trois provinces, l'Alberta, la Saskatchewan, l'Ontario, qui ne semblent pas avoir d'appétit pour ce genre euh, de, de réglementation. Est-ce que politiquement, ça ne rend pas l'opération difficile, le règlement difficile à, à appliquer? Je pense que si on utilise M. Poliev comme un critère d'évaluation de nos politiques publiques en matière d'environnement, de, de lutte au changement climatique, euh, M. Poliev, la position officielle du Parti conservateur du Canada est que les changements climatiques n'existent pas. C'est la position du parti présentement. Euh, et le parti, M. Poliev semble être incapable de dire oui à quoi que ce soit. Alors, il, les voitures électriques, ce n'est pas plus efficace que les voitures à essence. Ça, 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 c'est plus polluant, alors que toutes les études démontrent le contraire. M. Poliev veut rendre la pollution gratuite, alors que nous avons mis un prix sur la pollution. Donc, il veut que ce soit encore plus facile pour les grands pollueurs au pays, notamment ses amis des pétrolières, de polluer encore plus. Euh, avec M. Poliev, donc, on va assister à une, une diminution de la qualité de l'air, diminution de la qualité de l'eau. Euh, face au changement climatique, M. Poliev dit « moi, je ne crois pas à ça ». Alors, plus de changements climatiques au Canada. Donc, euh, c'est… C'est classique de, de, de M. Poliev que de s'opposer à toute mesure environnementale, même quand ces mesures-là sont au bénéfice économique de la population canadienne, comme l'annonce d'aujourd'hui, qui va permettre sur une période de 10 ans, un ménage moyen au Canada, d'épargner 30 000 dollars. Thank you, Minister. And perhaps uh, now a question in English. Uh, Charles C. Agro, uh, you can go ahead. Hi there, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I appreciate many of your comments already about um, charging, but I just wanted to press you a little bit further there. Um, Canadian consumers and critics have been really clear that you're you're putting the cart before the court the cart um, before the horse here when it comes to charging. There doesn't seem to be any concrete plan moving forward um, to really establish a network that is both fair with respect to access, but also with respect to pricing. So can you just address the fact that with so much of our hydro in this country in the hands of our provinces, um, what is the, com the concrete comprehensive plan moving forward to ensure access and also fairness in pricing when it comes to charging? I would, I would respectfully disagree with your characterization of the situation because we already have two provinces that are above the 20% mark for, for new vehicles being, being sold, Quebec and, and, and British Columbia. And for, on average for Canada, we're setting that target for, for, for 2026. Uh, between the end of 2020, and uh, the first quarter of this year, sales of EVs 
on average in Canada have tripled. We went from about 4% to 13%. So it's happening, and clearly those Canadians feel that the infrastructure, the infrastructure, the infrastructure charging stations in, in place are, are sufficient because they're going for, for electric vehicles. But despite that, we are, we have a very clear plan, whether it's the Infrastructure Bank of Canada, which are, whether it's the Ministry of Natural Resources, to deploy by 2029, we'll go from about 25,000 25, charging stations that we have now to about 85,000 by, by, by 2029. On a per capita basis, it's gonna be higher than what we're seeing in, in, in other countries uh, similar to ours. Okay, hey, uh, also as a follow-up, will your government match the purchase incentives that we're seeing in the U.S. from the Biden administration? And will you expand those incentives to include households that want to buy a used EV? So right now, uh, federally, the purchase incentive is $5,000, and that's the plan uh, that we have uh, m moving forward. What will happen in the future? Will we change it? Will we, will we adapt? Will, will we adapt it? I don't know, but this is what we have now. Thank you, Minister. Uh, and now a question from Nathaniel Dove, Global News. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have my, my questions are about the, um, the credits uh, and the penalties that car makers could face. I, I understand that credits are worth $20,000. And that they can be used uh, to trade against the uh, their limits, um, but will the car maker have to pay like exactly that amount? It sounded on the technical briefing this morning that uh, any penalties for missing uh, their their targets uh, would be up to the enforcement officer. So I think there's there's two things in in your question. There's the crediting system that we're we're putting in place, uh, and and there's various there, there's a couple of different flexibility mechanisms that we're we're putting in place to help uh, automakers achieve the their 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 targets. Uh, early sales in 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 2024 2025. So before the entry into force of the regulation in in, in 2026 would would be one of them. The the investment in in charging stations uh, is is another flexibility mechanism. That that has been included in 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 the regulatory system in, ter in terms of if if a company uh, would be out of compliance uh, then they would have to pay a fine uh, which is uh, what is usually the way we do things w in Canada when it comes to to, to, to environmental performance or, or lack thereof uh, environment and climate change Canada just imposed a one million dollar penalty on a plant in Saskatchewan that was releasing toxic substances in 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 a river that's you know, not not unusual. Unfortunately, it happens, and that's how that's how penalties are are imposed. And sorry, just to to clarify that. So it's it's, I guess my follow up. It's the uh, your ministry mon monitoring uh, and and enforcing uh, the penalties. And, and yes, is it's there environment a range, and climate change Canada that's and, responsible and, for that? Yes. And is there a range, sorry, of of penalties? Is this already included in the regulations? What is the range? It is included in the regulations. What is that range? Sorry. Well, that's your third follow-up question, I believe, if not your fourth, but we'll be happy to provide you with the, the, the specific information. Thank you, Minister. And uh, now a question from uh, Carbon Pulse. Uh, Alison, you can go ahead. Hi, Minister Gabriel. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So I, I would like to ask, I know that today's focus has largely been on battery, battery electric vehicles, but given that fuel cell vehicles also fall under the range of zero emission vehicles, can we expect any investments or policy geared towards uh, fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen refueling infrastructure in the near future? Uh, we do, we already have incentives for 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 these. We mo mainly focused on on electric vehicles because this is the reality right now. There are some uh, hydrogen vehicles uh, on on the road, few charging stations, so it's it's limited uh, in in scope in terms of where it can be used. But yes, hydrogen is is part of the the regulations. 
Great. And just as a brief follow up, could you expand just a little add in, bit? There is investment sure. happening in hydrogen, re hydrogen refueling hubs. So there is one most recently just up at Pearson Airport that's being developed for vehicles up there. So it is, of course, the focus today is on, on electric, battery electric, but there is infrastructure that's built under the zero emission vehicle infrastructure program for hydrogen as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, uh, Parliamentary Secretary De Bruzen. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh, 